Okay, so a couple things as we get started. Uh, first thing is I have a request from the DSS services for a note taker. If anybody wants to be a note taker and get, uh, I think you can get paid or you can get volunteer hours for it. Um, let me know if you're interested. You can fill out this, cord, this card and give it to them and I don't know what they do, some kind of magic. So anyway, if you want to take notes, it's there and you can do it. Uh, next thing, you got two handouts today. First one is for assignment 107. And no, I have not lost my mind as much as you might think I have. Uh, it is supposed to be assignment 107, not assignment 104. Um, the reason that you're getting assignment 107 now is we're going to start talking about multi-page InDesign layouts today and or portfolios. And guess what? Your final for this class is a portfolio. So this is due at the very end of the semester, but you start working on it today and continue working on it until the end of the semester. Um, it is due on Monday the 20th of May at 9.30 in the morning. We have our regular class time that day. That is Monday of finals week. We still have class on Wednesday. It's weird, okay? Why they changed it and did it this way. But, so here's how it's gonna work. Uh, last semester I had it due on Wednesday and everybody hated it because everybody has all their finals on Wednesday or, or Thursday because everybody waits till the last day. So I didn't think it was fair. So it's going to be due on Monday. You'll come in, you'll do your survey, You'll come in, you'll have your donuts, because I always bring donuts on the quote last day. We'll do that. Then on Wednesday, which is actually a class day and you actually have to show up, all you have to do is come in, check in with me, and then you can work on whatever you want to work on. Study for your other finals, whatever. But technically speaking, because they switched to this 16 week semester, I have to have class both days of finals week. And so I'm trying to make everything do on Monday so you don't have to stress out about it with all the rest of your finals. I'm trying to be nice and do that, but you still technically have to show up on Wednesday. So the only thing that you're going to do on that Wednesday is show up and get a checkbox for showing up that day. Does that make sense? So everything will have already been done. You will have turned everything in. There's no more responsibilities other than you have to appear in front of me. Okay? So that's um, everything's due on uh, the 20th. The 22nd you just show up, etc. So beginning today, you're going to start working on your portfolio. For those students who wait until the last weekend to work on their portfolio, it will not turn out well. I promise you that. So the fact that I'm giving it to you now means that I actually think it will take this amount of time to get a good portfolio out. So you should start working on it now uh, and not wait. We will have a few more days in class where we work on portfolio, but most of the portfolio is your responsibility. It's the final for the end of the class. You should be working on it. If you want my feedback, you can come to office hours. You can corner me in class. I can redline it, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, I'm there for you, but there's not that much class time to be working on it. Um, we will do the cover. I'll do a whole lecture on portfolio covers a little bit later. This is a printed portfolio. So while most stuff today is turned in digitally, um, you could still create digital PDF of this particular portfolio. This one is going to be printed. You will give me a printed version. I will grade the printed version. That being said, in the back of the room today, there is a whole stack of previous semester portfolios. Some of them go back a ways. So I would encourage you today, as part of your exercise, to actually come back here and look through these. Sit down with them. Have an idea of what students have done in the past. There's nothing wrong with looking at them. There's a big stack of them. I've tried my best to cull through them. I think most of these are A's and B's. Uh, so anything that was too bad has been pulled out. Um, so you can take a look. Some of them are really, really good. Um, at the end of the semester, sometimes people leave their portfolios. Sometimes they take them. Frequently, the A students take their portfolios. So I don't have those anymore because they want them back. Um, but they're all in the back, so you can have a look at what the printed version looks like. And to me, there's something rewarding about having the printed version and to have it as a physical thing, uh, even though it's becoming so common to just send people a PDF of, of your uh, documents. So uh, one more time, it's due on Monday. There's a mistake on I'm turn down here on the turning in. It says Wednesday. It should say Monday. That was from last semester. Monday the 20th, you post everything. Okay. Be aware that if it is not turned in on that Monday, it will be late, and that's a bad thing. So just plan on that Monday. Okay. So we will continue on with exercise 112 today, but before we get into that, I'm going to start talking about portfolios in general and give you a kind of an overview of portfolios. 
And as much as I'd rather be there, we're going to get back into the world of portfolios here in just a second. Where'd it go? There we go. So we're going to talk today about portfolios. And I think portfolios are absolutely an essential part of being a designer. You have to have a way of telling people who you are. Who are you as a designer? And you do that through a portfolio. I think the, the, the great summary of a portfolio is it is the story of you. It is the story of who you are and what you're interested in design. And that then gets you jobs, gets you into school, tells you where you're placed in school, all of those kinds of things that are really important. I think one of the, one of the downsides of portfolios is they often focus too much on, hey, I'm really good at Illustrator, or I'm really good at Photoshop, as opposed to who are you as a designer? And that's a distinctly different question. If you wanted to get a job being a drafts person to just draw lines all day for somebody else's designs, then you would show a very technical, like, this is all the AutoCAD work I can do. Please hire me to do this. But if you are a designer and you want to be hired as a designer, if you want to be hired for your brain and your ability to critically think, then the portfolio is a critical document for that because it is telling who you are as a designer. So you want to make sure you tell that story. And what makes you unique? There's lots of designers out there. Who are you? And why are you different from everybody else? That belongs in the portfolio as well. So the first thing we're going to see when we open that portfolio was obviously the cover. But we'll talk about the cover as a whole separate lecture. We open up that portfolio. The first thing we see is we need to have some kind of a, a table of contents, a title page that tells people what to expect. What's coming in this book? of body of work. It should identify who you are as the designer. It should probably have your name, for example. It identifies what are the projects in your portfolio. That's also critical. And it may contain some in additional information about yourself. I've seen it done where you actually include kind of resume points on that first page. And sometimes that's a successful thing. Portfolios should always be current. They're a working document. They're not a finite. I have my portfolio. That's what I always use. I never update it. Well, guess what? You're always doing new projects, so those new projects should be in it. You should think about a portfolio as never being more than maybe three to five years old. So those projects that I did back in grad school, not really relevant anymore. Think about what is currently happening. What are you doing right now? And that should be folded into the portfolio. So it's the kind of document that you're going to update maybe after every semester. You do a bunch of school projects, you take summer break, and then when you get to summer break, you spend a little time and you update your portfolio, you get those projects in. You did the Mondrian Museum, you did the Calder Museum for 121, you stick those in. You're in 220, you do the um, architecture art school, you get that one in. So after that semester, you always kind of add in what's the new best project that you have. Know the purpose of each project in your portfolio. So I think one of, the, one of the challenges, especially early on in the, in the design process, is that you guys do a beautiful rendering, for example, or you do a beautiful drawing, and you stick it in your portfolio because it's a beautiful drawing. That's great. But maybe you're really good at something like watercolor, and suddenly your portfolio becomes all watercolors because you're good at it. And you're like, oh, these are all great, and I put them all in my portfolio. What's the purpose of each of those watercolors? They're all showing the same thing. So you want to know, and if you think about this, you want to know what the purpose of each particular piece is. You want to show that you're really good at building models. You want to show that you're really good at doing 3D renderings. You want to show that you're really good at drawing. You want to show that you're really good at technical detail. Whatever it is that you're trying to show, each of those projects should reflect that. Now, obviously, you're trying to show that you're really good with the design, too. So you want to make sure you know what that purpose is. So here's the other tricky thing. In school, you end up doing group work. And the truth, truth be told, in the real world, everything you do is group work. You always have a team. But when you're thinking about it in terms of portfolio, it can get a little awkward. Because we work together, and suddenly, who did what? And who's responsible for what? Well, remember also that you're applying for the same scholarship, school, job that the person in your group is also applying for. So when those people who are selecting you for the scholarship, the school position, the job, et cetera, when they open two portfolios that have the same project in it, 
they're going to know that it was a group project. And so if you pass it off as, this is my project, and I didn't have any help, that's a bad thing. So when it comes to group work, you have to identify this is a group project. This is something we did together. But then focus on your contribution to the group. So let's say we were doing the, D, the, the 220 project, the architecture school. And let's say that I did the technical drawings. I did the elevations and the floor plans. And somebody else did the renderings. My partner did the renderings. The rendering shouldn't really appear in my portfolio, because that wasn't my responsibility. I should focus on the technical drawings. And so when it comes to that page in the portfolio, as I'm introducing the page, and it might be in the body of text, I might say, this is the project that I did with my partner, so and so. And my focus was on the technical floor plans, et cetera. And then the stuff that I'm showing is the floor plans and the elevations. My partner, on the other hand, would say the same thing. I worked with Grant, and we did this project. And I focused on doing the collage work and the renderings. And here's all the collage work and the renderings. Does that make sense? So you're focused on what your contribution is rather than what the overall project is. And of course, you're talking about the design and the decisions you made and all of those kinds of pieces uh, as well. A killer portfolio is well designed. And I think that's a great way of summarizing it. A good portfolio takes time to think through all that graphic design stuff. All the text, all the typography, all of that fits together. And suddenly, this feels like a great body of work. The other truth about a portfolio is the better it is, the better it, it has been designed, the less you notice the portfolio and the more you notice the work that's in the portfolio. So you don't get stuck on the portfolio. You get focused in on the work, and you get drawn in. And so a really good portfolio will do that. It will sit nicely in the background and cause you to focus on the work itself. Trust your intuition. That's a big one. So understanding the setup of the page. Inner margin versus the outer margin. I would make the inner margin bigger because of the binding. And so depending on which style of binding, we will have a lecture where we talk specifically about binding. Here's an example of a portfolio that I grabbed from the back. This one has a tape binding on the end. When you go to open, let's see if I can find one with an image that goes into the gutter here. When you have an image like this, it, some of the image gets lost in that crease. It's hard to see all of it in there. So if you think about putting any important content you know, in the picture, does it matter? No. I can lose a little bit of the picture there. But let's say I put some text in there. The text would get chopped off. That wouldn't be good. It's hard to read the text. The other thing, the same thing happens if I come back here on some of the other bindings. That one is a tape binding. If I have the spiral bindings, Guess what? There's a whole row of holes that cuts through everything. Right? Cuts right through. So if you put anything important in there, guess what? It's going to have a bunch of holes in it. So depending on your style of binding, you can lose content. Therefore, I say the inner margin should be a little bit bigger than the outer margin, maybe twice the outer margin. That gives you space for that binding. Anticipate your binding style. Up to a quarter of an inch might get lost, either through cutting holes or down in the crease of the gutter. All of those are important. Next thing is something called bleed. And bleed is absolutely critical uh, when you start thinking about professionally printing something. Now, the printers here at school are not professional printers. The printers at FedEx are not professional printers. If you go to a real print shop, they do have these kinds of uh, printers, and this starts to matter. So imagine for a second, and I'll explain how this <coughs> fits into what we're doing today anyway, or even the school printers in a second. But imagine for a second that we're printing a magazine. We're printing Money Magazine or something like that. You're printing a million copies of this print magazine. Is it likely that somewhere along the way, the paper gets skewed, something doesn't quite happen, it doesn't come off the print press perfectly? Yeah, that happens in the print process. So what we do to accommodate that, and this is when we have an image that we want to go all the way off the edge of the page. So just like that portfolio that I just showed you, this one has a lot of those in it. The image goes all the way off the page. There's no little white lines or anything on the outside. That's what we're talking about here. When we go to print something and we set up the InDesign document, we leave a little bit of extra space around the outside of our document, all the way around the outside. That extra space is called bleed. 
And so when we export it with the bleed and it's printed, extra is printed and then cut off so that the image always goes all the way off the page. Even if it's a little skewed, even if it didn't quite print correctly when they cut the magazine, there's enough extra. You're never going to see a little white sliver along the edge. So this is challenging when it comes to the printers here at school. If we were going to do this, let's say we had an 8.5 by 11 page and we wanted to have full bleed, i.e. the page, the print, the image goes all the way off the edge of the page, we can't print like that on the school printer. There's always a white border around it. You guys have tried this before, right? So instead, we would print on a larger size piece of paper, let's say an 11 by 17 piece of paper. We'd have crop marks that would print with it, and we'd cut it afterwards to make sure that that went all the way off the edge of the page. So in a professional print shop, that's what happens. They print on a slightly larger page, and then they trim the book so that it's all perfect, and you've got plenty of extra um, image to have that happen. The other thing is we need CMYK mode for printing. If you choose a print document in InDesign, it will automatically be in CMYK mode. We'll talk about what color space is in a few lectures. So just trust me for right now, but that's important when it comes to printing. So here's the setup, for example. We have our bleed edge, we have our trim line, which would be our final page size. And then in this scenario, so there's our bleed, that outermost line right there. The, that line right there is where we want to be trimming to. This dotted line is our margin. That's where the bulk of our content's going to go. Our text isn't going to go past that, for example, but our images might go past it. We have a little bit more space in the center to accommodate whatever the binding type would be in here. And so this gives us our overall setup. If you look at the dimensions of the page, right, we're shooting for 8.5 by 11, but they're actually an eighth of an inch, or in this case, a quarter of an inch bigger because of that bleed. So it's a little bit larger than the page size that we would be expecting. The other option would be, of course, to make a smaller page or a smaller booklet. You'll see some of those there. So you could print it all. So let's look at some examples. So I'm going to show this example first, uh, and I'll end up showing a lot of his work later on. This is Alex Holgreff. His, his um, website is visualizingarchitecture.com. He was an architecture student, <coughs> graduated with a degree in architecture, and then decided he didn't want to be a traditional practicing architect. And instead, his focus is on architectural visualization. He does the visuals for other architects. So they send him his work. He does beautiful renderings and stuff of that work. And his whole firm is based on that. He has several versions of his portfolio. You can actually buy his portfolio. He, he publishes it. Uh, this is an older version of it. But I think it's a great example uh, of great graphic design and great layout. So this is the cover that was done to wrap all the way around. Uh, and this is what the cover looks like of this particular portfolio. And then we'll get into the content. So I'm not focusing too much on the covers. We'll come back to covers a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, and for right now, we'll focus on the content that's in the portfolio. So each of these pieces that I'm going to show you are a spread. So the binding is right along here. And so as we open the book like this, we get the back half of a page and the front half of a page. This is called facing pages. So each of these spreads is folded in the center. So just be aware as I show you each page that that's what's going to happen. So this is his table of contents, or his introductory page. So like I said before, that introductory page should have some information about yourself on it, right there. And it should have what are the projects that are going to be included in this particular portfolio. And he's done some creative things here where he's identified each project with a little graphic. And that graphic will come back on, on subsequent pages. But he has a little bit of text describing each of the projects as well. So let's jump forward. This is our first page that we're seeing. A couple things of note. One, there's that fold line, again, so that the pages are facing each other. And he's established this as about a 2 thirds, 1 third ratio. So this here would be about 2 thirds, and this to that edge would be about 1 third. So there's kind of a consistency to that. Maybe it's a quarter. It might be more like a quarter. 
three quarters and one quarter. But we'll see as we go into subsequent pages that that same thing repeats itself. So we have the same kind of two thirds, one third, only this time it's reversed. The image is over here on the left, right here, and the rest of this is the white. So it's important to recognize how this is flowing page to page. Font choices are all similar. They're all going to be consistent throughout the document. The other thing that he's done is this upper corner here identifies the project. That graphic that I showed you on the table of contents shows up on the pages that are related to that particular project. So we'll jump forward here again. We've moved into a different project, but this still feels very similar. Notice there's our, that bar at the bottom gives us our, our page break again, right there. Um, this here would be a flow line across that, this document. That flow line is similar, although the flow line was at the top before. It's moved down. Uh, and we get some really great graphics here. The upper corner there and there is a different icon because this represents a different project. But again, it's in the same place. It's just a little bit different icon. There we go. Looks very similar. There's our division. Once again, gray bar just moved from being down here to up there as we go through. And again, this is fairly consistent. To me personally, this page is, has way too much yellow on it. It's a little bit hard to read. The, the text and stuff is too hard to read. I think it would be better against the white <laughs> backdrop. Um, but you know that's a personal preference. Notice these still exist in the upper corners. So consistency, page to page. And we'll talk a lot about that in InDesign a little bit later on. So another example here, three column, three column layout. This is the one place that he's chosen to move that graphic. I disagree with that. I think it really still belongs up here. I think it's clouded because it's down at the bottom there. I'm not sure why he moved it. You can tell that his graphics are really nice, right? A set of renderings. I think this is nicely done again. Uh, notice that this division still occurs at a consistent mark. There it is, and there it is. OK, let's look at another example. I have no idea who this is. It's not one of my students. It was an example set that I found online, but I think it's a good one. I like the cover too, but we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So first page, as you open that portfolio, we're seeing the classic table of contents on the right with little graphics that represent what the project is. And on the left this time, they're showing a little bit of information about themselves. Now, I have to point one thing out. People often do this. They do this on a resume. They do this uh, in a portfolio. They identify certain software, and they, they try to put like a star rating of, like, I'm this good at this particular software. Okay, If you're applying for a job, the last thing that I want to know is that you're kind of mediocre at Rhino. Like, don't sell yourself short. Let somebody figure that out based on your work. Don't just say, oh, I'm only this good. OK? So leave that kind of stuff off. If you say, if you want to put what you're proficient in, just say, I'm proficient in AutoCAD and Rhino and everything else under the sun. Don't say, yeah, I'm only sort of good at Rhino. That's not a good way to sell yourself. OK? So don't do that. No good. Get rid of that. But there's our table of contents. There's other information about yourself. If you want to include that kind of um, resume information, sometimes it's nice. The reason that this resume information is nice is because as the person who's evaluating you is looking at your body of work, they're stuck with your resume too, as opposed to having it in a separate pile. Now, typically, you'd have to, if let's say we're applying for a job, you would submit the resume and you submit the portfolio. They probably look at the resume first. And then once they whittle it down to these are our candidates, then we'll look at the portfolio. So it's a little bit redundant, but you can choose to do it if you want to. OK, so let's look at some of the pages. I don't have as many pages from um, his work. But again, there's a certain consistency page to page. I think this one, the typography is very well done. It's carefully considered, and it's consistent on every page. Was that it? Did I only get one page out of it? Yeah. Apparently, that's all you get. Another example here, table of contents in that introduction, nothing about them. 
I think it would be nice to at least have a, your name in there. Next page, he has the full resume. And there we go. Now this as a spread looks great. But if you imagine for a second that it's folded right in the middle of this page, so remember there's our spread and it's folded, the project that they designed is right in the crack. Is that a good layout? No, it looks beautiful as a spread, but it doesn't look good when you actually print it because your project's wedged down there. So take that, move it over to one side, move it over to the other side, give yourself some space. Remember, rule of thirds composition, great time to move things over. So as beautiful as this rendering is. So another thing that's important here is you've got a full color image behind and you put the white text on it. If this were printed, you would lose that text. It's too thin to show up against the background. And for those of you that will end up putting white text on an image, I will always tell you, go over to the printer and print it because you'll learn a whole lot about the fact that it doesn't show up if it's too thin. It just gets muddled. So if you're going to print white text on a colored background, it has to be thicker, fatter text so that you can actually see the white and have it clear. Now, if it's only a digital portfolio, it's still probably readable because you're looking at it on a screen versus looking at it in print form. So just be aware of that. Uh, bold text works great in that kind of a scenario. Another set of pages from this portfolio. So uh, Bashir was a student of mine probably three or four years ago, I would say. Um, and I, I included his portfolio here. And I keep saying I'm going to add more student portfolios. Uh, this was with his permission. I told him I was going to do it. Um, and I do this because this way I can show you somebody whose work is the same as yours, theoretically. I mean, obviously, the projects are different. But basically speaking, what he's done is about what you'll do while you're here. And so this is how he chose to organize his work uh, as he was moving on um, going forward in school. So that was his cover. This is his first intro page. And he chose to have two. We had a table of contents and then an actual introduction page. This was his intro. And then it moves into each of his projects. He's organizing this by projects, not by software, and not by class. He's saying, this is my best project. This is my next best project, et cetera. So as we look at this, this is his Mondrian Museum. And so he starts laying this out. And again, we have kind of the big image on one side. We have the three small images. That theme repeats itself. We've got the big set of elevations. We've got the smaller sets of images on the opposite side. The fonts are consistent. Here's his Calder Museum, 2 thirds, 1 third layout. His little pavilion here. So here's an example of group work. There's all the students that worked on it. So he's not hiding behind, this is my project. He's saying, hey, this is we all worked on this. Then when we get to the next page, it's about the stuff that he did, the contr contributions that he did. And here he spends a lot of time talking about the technical details of what he did relating to this particular project. Here's some other um, articles. This visualizing architecture is Alex Holgraf's site. If you haven't ever visited, I would encourage you to do that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit more time. I'm not going to give us a break going into uh, InDesign today. I'm going to go straight into that. So give me just a second to switch over. And then we will uh, talk about how do you set this stuff up in Des InDesign? How do you get your bleed set correctly, et cetera? You guys are going to start on your portfolio today. You have two things already that can go in your portfolio. You have your best photograph. And you have your um, Photoshop collage. Those two things can already go in. If you have other work, work that you've done outside, you've worked in 121, et cetera, great thing to put those into your portfolio as well. The cool thing about portfolio, especially in an InDesign document, is it's a living document. You can always rearrange the pages. You can always add more things and cut things at the end. And so don't be afraid to put stuff in and then ultimately take it out. I'm not under the delusions that your final portfolio that you're going to turn into Cal Poly or Berkeley or, or a job is going to have all your digital tools work in it. Actually, I think you're probably going to cut that out. 
But since this is the final for this class, you do have to include it. So it is required in the portfolio that you have all six of your assignments. You do not have to have your exercises in it. So it should at least have the six assignments. If you want to include anything else, that's fine. If you want to include any work from outside of this class, 120 work, 220 work, 121 work, 130 work, 131 work, any of that stuff can go in the portfolio as well. So you can always add to it, but I at least want the assignments from this class. Yeah. Can personal work go in? Absolutely. Absolutely. It can and should. Um, the reason that I say that it's required for you guys to put the assignments in from this class is because that's a way of evening the playing field. You all have to deal with the fact that you have a 24 by 36 AutoCAD drawing to put in. You all have to deal with an 11 by 17 poster that somehow has to go in. So those formatting issues will be consistent for everybody to solve. But beyond that, if you have any extra content, by all means, you should put it in. Furthermore, if you want to make your portfolio have all that other good content in front of the assignments and stuff from digital tools, that's OK. I won't be offended. Okay, So any work that you want to put in is fair game. But you at least have to have the assignments. OK, so let me switch over. We're going to talk about multi-page InDesign layouts in just a second. OK, so on we go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up InDesign. We're going to be creating a brand new document for our portfolio. And like I said, I would spend some time today looking at the other example portfolios and thinking about what the format should be. Do you want it to be a square? Do you want it to be 11 by 17? Do you want it to be in portrait? Do you want it to be in landscape? How do you want this booklet to really turn out? Uh, and I think looking at a bunch of examples can help you kind of sort through what's the correct format for your, for your project. Um, so don't be, don't be shy about spending some time back there. That's part of today's purpose. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to click on the Create New button. And we're going to be working in print form. So I'm going to make sure I choose print. This is where I was saying as long as you're in print, you're going to get the right CMYK style color space to be working in. So just make sure I choose print. And then we have our letter sized. Um, and so there's some other sizes available. I'm going to pick letter. I'm going to change my units here to be in inches. Uh, and I'm going to choose that I want it to be in landscape orientation. Some people end up making this square. They want an 8 by 8. And you'll see that in the back. That's fine. You would set that up here. It's a custom size. So I'd end up typing you know, 8 i n by 8. IN, and that would be 8 inches by 8 inches. So you can always customize it if you want. I'm going to go back to um, the letter sized here in inches. There we go. I am going to keep the box checked for facing pages. It is not required that you have facing pages, um, but sometimes it's nice to have facing pages. It's interesting. Facing pages are less important today than they were uh, three years ago, because more and more portfolios are turned in digitally in which case you're seeing page after page after page versus back and front of a page. So it's just kind of something that's changing because of the world of digital portfolios. People are thinking it more as an individual page, less as a spread. Um, when I was applying to grad school, uh, for example, there was it had to be a printed physical portfolio, and there was a page limit. You got a total of 12 pages. Well, if you printed back and front on those pages, you got 24 pages, which was a lot better than 12 single-sided pages. So you ended up doing facing pages by default. So it varies a little bit. I'm going to leave it up to you. You don't have to do facing pages, but you can. So today I'm going to show you facing pages, but if you want to do it without, that's OK uh, as well. OK, so I'm going to start on page number one here. I'm not going to worry about the columns. Right here under margins, I'm going to go ahead and set my uh, top margin to be 0.25. That's going to change all of them. But I want my inside to be twice the outside. So I'm going to uncheck that chain. I'm going to break that chain so that I can change just the inside to 0.5. So I've got 0.25 on all of these, and then 0.5 for my inside. Then I'm going to come down to bleed and slug right here. And so in bleed and slug, this is what I was talking about. We're going to worry about bleed. Don't worry about slug. We'll leave that the same. Bleed is that extra space that's going to get cut off. I'd like that to be about an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to go ahead and type in 0.125, which is an eighth of an inch. And we'll do it uh, for the top, the bottom, the outside, but we don't need the inside. So I'll go ahead and set that inside back to 0. 
So I've got 0.125 for the top, the bottom, and the outside. Now that I've done that, I'll go ahead and click on the Create New. Oops. That I've meant to change to uh, my landscape. So hold on a second. There we go. So I wanted mine in, in uh, landscape orientation here. And so as I'm looking at my page now, I have my margin set. And remember, that's just a general guide. It's not, not critical. But then I also have this red line, this pinkish red line that goes outside of my page. That's that bleed. That's that extra content that's going to get cut off. So my goal is to have it right on this edge. So I don't, I don't want to think about keeping what's left. This is just extra printing. So I have this set up. I'm going to click on the Pages window right here. And we're going to look at the pages. My first page is page number one. We see it here. It's highlighted in blue. That's the page I'm working on. If I create two new pages, I'm going to go to the, the new page icon here. I'll create two new pages. And you see that I now have page one, page two, and page three. And pages two and three are working together as a spread. So there's pages two and three. There's the crease between the two pages. My binding would go right in here. And then I have my bleed going all the way around the outside. So that's giving my next two pages. I could click on new page again, and I end up with pages four and pages five. Does that make sense so far? So I'm creating a multiple page document. My content is going to go on different pages. For today's purposes, I'm not going to worry about page one. We'll think of this as like the cover page. I'm going to start working on pages two and pages three. And so that first page two and page three, that was where I wanted to put my table of contents, information about myself. So we're going to start kind of creating a general layout as we go forward. Um, and I would encourage you starting probably on pages two and three. Four and five would be my first project, maybe my best photograph, something like that. Uh, and then maybe pages six and seven would be my, my um, Photoshop file. You'll see. Maybe you only need, you know, one would be your best photo. Sorry, page four would be your best photo. Page five would be your Photoshop file. I don't know. You have to kind of sort through that. It takes a time to create a really great portfolio. You have to kind of start putting things in and start playing around with them, starting to understand how do you want this portfolio really set up. Um, but I want to talk about a couple things that will help us get this set up um, organized. So InDesign has something called a page master. And we see up here in the pages window that I have something called an A master. I can create multiple masters, and we'll get to those in just a second. The purpose of a master is for things that appear on every page so that they end up in exactly the same place on every page. So for example, if I wanted to have a gray bar that appeared on every page that was going to have my text on it or something, or the, the right side of the page I always wanted to have gray bar, for example, I could come up to my A master here. I'm going to double click on the right page of my A master. There it is. And I'll go ahead and I'll create a shape. And let's say this is maybe 4 inches wide by 8.5 inches tall. Say OK. There it is. I'm going to flip my color, and I'm going to make that uh, a gray here. I'm going to change my K value to maybe be 50. So it's a 50% gray. And I'm going to drop it right over here. Now, I want to make sure this gray actually includes the whole is, is never has a white border around it. So I'll make that gray box a little bit bigger out to the bleed line, like that. So now I have this gray box that's been established on the right side of the A master. Well, guess what? If I come down here to my pages, every page on the right side here is going to have that gray bar on it. The other thing about it is I can't do anything to it if I'm on the actual page. I'm on page five right now. I can't change it. So I could start actually putting in some of my content here. Uh, so I could, I could come over here and I could say, OK, well, on this, I'm going to put 
then image, we go to file, and then place. Sorry, wrong. I'll right click fitting, fill frame proportionally. There you go. And remember that frame should really go all the way out to my bleed. And then once again, I'll right click fitting, fill frame proportionally. And now that image is there and this gray bar is on the right side. That image is only on page four and five. It's not on page two and three because it wasn't done on the master. <coughs> if, however, I came back up to the master and I said, you know what, I want there to be a line that goes right here, and I want that line to be a little bit thicker. Stroke just so we can see it. Something like that. That line now, is going to appear on every page. So there it is on page one, there it is on page uh, three, and there it is on page five. Do you see how that works? So whenever I put something on the master, it's gonna show up on every page. The one thing you want to be careful with on a master, however, is text. Because if I were to come up here to the master and I were to say, this is assignment one, for example, right there. The size here needs to change a little bit. Let me switch over to my typography. And let me get to my character here. <coughs> okay, so I have that listed as assignment one, like that. Well, guess what? On every page now, if I go back down to my pages, that assignment one is gonna be on all of these pages. And furthermore, I can't click on it and change it because it's on the master. So type is one of those things where it's a little iffy to put it on a master. There are some places where type is relevant. So for example, I can actually set up a page number on every page. So let me go back up to the A master here. If I wanted a page number to show up on the bottom right corner, I can do that. Let me click on the text tool, the type tool, I'll create a little text box, and then in this text box, I'm going to go up to my type menu. I'm going to come down to insert special character, and it's going to be under uh, markers, and I'll choose current page number. And so you say, wait a minute, it showed up as an A. Why is that? Well, I'm on the A master, so it's showing up as A. That, I could come in, we could adjust the size. I'm going to make it bigger so it's easier for you guys to see it, though in all reality, I probably wouldn't have it that big. Let me change that, and let me put it right down here. So it's right there in the corner. So I have that there on the master. Well, now if I go to page one, that's going to be substituted with page one. If I go to page two, or excuse me, page three, it's going to be substituted with page three. Same thing here with page five, it's going to have a five on it. <coughs> so. It's a really good way of putting content based on page number. So we can do that. Okay, so I'm starting to establish this. Now sometimes maybe I want on a certain page, let's say I didn't want the gray bar on this side of the page, I wanted it over on that side of the page. So this is an example where I could create multiple masters. So I have my A master here and the gray bar is on this side of the page. If I go and I right click up here, I could say let's create a new master so I'll click here for new master. This new master is going to be called B master. I'll go ahead and say okay. And so now I have the A master and I have the B master. So if I wanted on the B master to have the gray bar on this side of the page, I could create the gray bar. Um, and I'll go ahead and say okay. We'll flip it and I had that as a 50% gray. Oops. Uh, 
All right, so now I have that gray bar established. It's different than the A master, where I have the gray bar on the right. And what if I wanted that to be applied to this spread instead? So in that scenario, I would need to select my pages. So there's my two pages. I held down Shift to select them both. I'll right click, and I'll come to Apply Master to Pages. And I'll switch from the A master to the B master. And when I do that, the little A in the upper corners of the page will switch to a B, and lo and behold, my master changes. And so you can have as many masters as you want up here, and you can apply it to the pages in any way that you want. Now on a particular master, you can choose to have frames. So let's say that I wanted to set this up and I wanted to have um, I don't know, a frame like this. So I'm going to use my align tools here to make sure that I set these correctly. So I'll take those two. I'll pick this as the key image. I'm going to turn on my object and layout and align. And I'm going to use the distribute spacing at an eighth of an inch. All right, let's do a 16th, 0 0.0625. I'll make sure that I have a 16th between those two. I'm then going to take these and this image make sure that that is my key image and I'll distribute the spacing that way. Wrong one. Unfortunately, I need to do them one at a time. Uh, let me deselect that. There we go. Let me distribute those. And I'll distribute those. That's just evening out my spacing between these. And then that one's okay. If I wanted these two to be centered, I could group them. So let me right click and say group. That'll make them act as one object now. And I can take them with this object. This is my key object. And I can distribute along the center. That's going to center these. I can come back to these two objects and ungroup them. I'll right click and say ungroup. And I can adjust. Sorry, I have to select just one of them. Come on. There we go. And I can adjust that one down to here. And I can adjust that one down to right there. So in that scenario, on the B master, I have those frames. I have this frame, and I have those two frames there. That's going to show up on every one of the pages that has the B master applied. So I'll come down to pages two and three, and there are those frames. Once again, I can't select them, but I can still place into these frames. So I can go up to File, and then Place. That was not what I was trying to click on. File, place, there we go. And I could drop in, say, this image. What I'll do is, once I've loaded it, I'll hover over my frame. You've got to love it when it doesn't work the way you want it to, right? It should drop it right into that frame. There we go. Right click, fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there's that image. I'll come back and try to place it in one of the other images. I'll go to File, and then Place. Pick one of my other images. I'll hover over this, and it should drop it right into that frame. Right click, fitting, fill frame proportionally, like that. If I wanted this image to get filled, same, same project here, I would go deselect everything, file, place, and we could drop this image right inside that frame. Once again, right click, fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there it is. Go away. So it looks like I made a little bit of a mistake. I didn't have that frame go all the way there. So I can correct it on the page itself, or I could correct it on the master so that it would work for every particular page. And there I end up with it like that. I told you that text is a little bit tricky. Um, and so if, for example, I wanted to have a some kind of text here. Instead of putting it on the master, I would start on an actual page. So let's do it on, uh, on this page here. I'll use my text tool. I'd create my text. I'm going to right click and say fill with 
placeholder text just so we can see some text on it. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. So let's go down to 10 point, something like that. OK, so if I wanted this text to show up on other pages, best thing to do would be to go to Edit and then Copy. And then when I come down to, say, page 5 here, right there, I could go to um, Edit, Paste in Place. That's going to put it in exactly the same place that it was up above. So if you're dealing with text, it's often better to just copy and then paste in place as you go from page to page so it's nice and consistent. So this is a lot about setting things up. There's a little bit more advanced features that we can use uh, using our masters. I'm going to go into that. This is the point where some people get lost. It's not required that you do this kind of thing. But I want to show it to you because it's one of the powerful things that's built into uh, InDesign. So you can do your portfolio with what I've just talked about. But you can also get a little bit more sophisticated about it. So let me come up to the A master here. And right here on the A master, I have assignment and then one listed. If I wanted this to dynamically change based on what assignment it was and keep this on the master, I can change this one to be over here under type, insert special character. Under markers, I can cha change and say section marker. And so it's going to uh, say assignment and then section. Don't worry about it for just now. If I come down here to this first page, it's not going to say anything because I haven't actually assigned it to anything just yet. So in this scenario, let me right click. And I'm going to come down to um, numbering and section options. So numbering and section options, this tells me where I can start my page numbering. But it also says, what section marker do I want it to have? So in this case, it would be assignment 1. And once I've established that, I can go ahead and say OK. And it's going to fill that in with a 1. Now down here on page 5, it's still saying assignment 1. But wait a minute, this is going to be assignment 2. I can right click. I can go to numbering and section options. And I can say, you know what, this is section two or assignment two, and it's going to change this to be assignment two. And so the advantage here is that as you change your page numbers, you can always adjust what that section marker is without actually going in and editing the text. So it's a more sophisticated way of kind of setting up chapters, for example, of your, of your book. Uh, and so it wouldn't have to say something like that, just two. I could actually replace it. Um, trying to think how I want to do this. Uh, we could get more sophisticated here. Instead of saying assignment here, I could just say section. And there, instead of just one, I could right click and go to numbering and section options. And I could write in here, this is actually assignment 101, for example. And that's going to start filling out there. So I don't have to just have a 1. I can actually get more sophisticated about what it is. So let me go ahead and numbering and section options here. And I could say that this is actually assignment 102. And on that page, it's going to say 102. So it's kind of like establishing chapters in a book uh, where we can get through that. If I wanted. Um, say this page number not to be a, a number. I could also go into numbering and section options. And I could change the page numbering style. Let's say I wanted it to be a Roman numeral, for example. It's going to be a Roman numeral until I get to the next section. So I have I, 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 I. And then I get into, oh, so IV and then 5 because that's my numbering and section. That changes to having a page number. So sometimes you might want your introduction to have different page numbers. You could do it that way in, in terms of style. So there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do. But again, it's more of an advanced topic as you start to set up a, a, a much larger multi-page InDesign document. Okay. So there's a lot to kind of take in today. I want you guys to have time to, to look at the existing portfolio, start to get yourself an idea. Uh, and then I'm, I'm expecting you guys for exercise 112 to try to create a couple pages. Intro page maybe, table of contents page, start to think about fonts, typography, what feels right. Uh, don't just pick the default font like I did. 
actually spend some time thinking about what's the right font, how does it belong, etc. Start thinking about general layout decisions and what you want that layout to look like. Try to bring in some content and start to explore that content. The more content you have, the easier it is to start to organize your work. If you only have assignment 101 and 102, it's hard to know, well, how's an 11 by 17 poster going to fit? Or how's a 24 by 36 AutoCAD drawing going to fit? Um, but the more stuff you have, the more you can start to play around with it and see how it does really fit. Okay? So I'll turn you loose today. You start on your portfolio today. It's due at the very end of the semester, so it's definitely a work in progress. When you go to export your work for today, you have a choice. I'm going to go back to this page here. No, I'll use this page right here. You're going to go to File, and then um, we're not going to create a PDF today. We're still going to create a JPEG. So I will go to Export. And then here, under my Export Options, I'm going to choose a JPEG. I'll go ahead and click on Save. And then right here, I can choose what page I want to export. I want to make sure that this is maximum quality at 300. Some of you had trouble with that uh, not turning out as well as you wanted. But then here's another option. I can choose to export my spreads, both pages together, or I can export individual pages. So it's your choice. So in this case, I want spreads. Uh, and my range is going to be, my page numbers got screwed up, so it's IV25. And then I'll go ahead and click Export. And that's going to export this spread and this spread only. I had no idea where I just saved that, but <laughs> you get the idea. Okay? So when you do that export, that's how you're going to be creating it. Remember, it doesn't matter that this is a little bit blurry in its preview state. If we right click and we go to Display Performance, High Quality Display, it'll sharpen up and we'll get the full resolution version of it. It's just the temporary low resolution version. Okay. Um, sometimes people want their uh, one of these bars or something to go over the top of content. So let me come back up to the A master here. Right. Let's say that I wanted my content to be transparent. I wanted this to go over the content. Uh, this can be a little bit tricky. You might have to use your layers to your advantage here. So I'm going to go ahead and take all of these objects. I'm going to go to the Layer menu. I'm going to create a brand new layer, Layer 2. And I'm going to drag all of this content up onto that layer. To do that, I will grab this box next to Layer 1, and I'll drag it up to Layer 2. There we go. By doing that, I've essentially given myself this is always going to be on top of anything I put on Layer 1. So Layer 2 is on top. Let me take the gray background here. Let me go into my effects. I'm going to change my opacity down maybe 50%. If I wanted the gray to be the same color, I would need to change the gray back to being 100% gray or 100% black, which is going to make the gray, you get, you get the idea. It's going to be a 50% gray because it's 50% of the full black. Anyway, so this has transparency now. If I go back to my pages and I jump down to page 5 here, if I took this image, move that over, I could make that image go underneath the, the uh, background here. Let me right click and go to fitting, fill frame proportionally. There we go. And that would be transparent under my gray. It doesn't work quite so well because of the background image is really dark to begin with, but you get the idea. Uh, let me try changing the image here to something else. See if we can see it a little bit better. Yeah, there. You can kind of see it a little bit better as you look at it. Uh, once again, it would go fitting, fill frame proportionally. Uh, it's still a little dark, but you guys get the idea. So in that scenario, maybe, maybe I have too much transparency on it. I could come back to my master. I could say, let's take this and let's go back to my effects. And let's say that instead of 50%, we want this to be you know, at like 75%. And maybe I want my text to be white instead of black. I can take my text, change the text to be white. And then this line here should probably be white. And then I could go back to my pages. And there it is. 
changed. This text here will probably need to be white. So you can kind of play around with how it, how it plays out. Okay? So I'm going to turn you guys loose and let you start. If you run into questions, by all means, let me know. Spend some time at the back. Look at the portfolios. That's an important part of today. Um, and uh, that's it.